Please help me welcome Tyler Voorhees. Thank you, Ken. Um, just to let you know, there will be a, a chance for any questions you have at the end, so if you have anything, just keep that in mind. Uh, before I get to the, you know, the meat of this Artist Talk sandwich, I wanted to thank a few people who really made this happen. Um, first and foremost, the staff at Wichita City Arts, uh, in particular, Sean Jones, who really helped me put this together. Uh, Lindsay Banaka is, is uh, you know, the former gallery director who really took a chance on me and let an artist who had never done this before do it. Um, Michael and Joey Melby Nankness, uh, Beth, Caitlin, Robin, and Kay who just introduced me. I really appreciate uh, what you've done for me, so thank you. I want to thank all my family members who come here. Um, just raise your hands just to show everybody how many people from my family are here. Uh, they came through the rain, the snow, the sleets. Um, and I'm just so touched that they're here to share this moment with me. Also, my my little family, my my wife, where's my wife? Yeah, there she is. Uh, and I, my son, and uh, my wife is my muse. You know, she's always inspired me to hear a little bit about that as I tell my story. Uh, she's my good idea filter, and so I really appreciate her efforts. Um, I also want to thank thank God. I think. Um, it's, everything goes back to him, so I just want a chance to thank, thank God. And I thank all of you for being here because your support of the arts make exhibitions like this possible and make uh, galleries like this exist. So thank you all for coming here. You know, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say at my artist talk, uh, I really got to the big questions. And perhaps the biggest question starts with what is art? And it's something people have been thinking about for centuries, millennia. Um, and to me, art is an expression. It's an expression of an idea. It's an expression of an emotion, um, uh, a story. And so I started thinking about, what is it about art that we enjoy so much? Why do we support it? Why do you come out on a Friday night to look at art? What is it about that? And really it's about the way that art moves us. It's, art does something to us, it changes us in even just a small way. It stirs our soul, it, it, it touches our innermost being and sticks with us. And so I think that's why we, why we enjoy art so much, why I enjoy it, making it so much, is because it, it helps me grow, it changes me. And so, my job as an artist, really, to think about it, is to express ideas, express stories and emotions that stir my soul, that, that get to my innermost place, my, my personality, my, um, you know, my being. And so this here that I've created, the jobs of yesteryear, they are the paintings and the, the pieces of work that stir my soul. And so I'm so proud to present them to you. And what are the jobs of yesteryear? For those of you that had a chance to look around, you probably gathered that this painting, these paintings, they all depict obsolete jobs. They, they go back in time and they look at what people did for work in history, and especially at jobs that don't exist anymore. And the reason I chose this is, you know, it's, it's many different reasons, but probably the biggest is that I've always been drawn to stories. I've always loved stories. And I've realized over time that the best stories, in my opinion, are true stories. Uh, it's something about it that I, as I hear them, I can take myself to that, that position of the person telling the story. And, and it just takes me away in a way. It touches me in a way. And so I wanted to tell some stories with my work. And I decided that. And so. You know, why did I choose obsolete jobs? Why am I looking at workers? Well, if you think about it, when you introduce yourself to people, really the first thing you tell them after your name is what you do for a living. And so to me, it's a way to connect to people, and it's a way to connect to our, our bigger identity, both present and past, and perhaps future, 
by connecting to the work that people have done through time. And so I wanted to create these stories and I wanted to connect to people. And so by depicting these obsolete jobs, I could do that. I could take myself back in time and, and exercise my imagination, as you probably noticed a little bit. But also to think about the evolution of work and how that has changed. And to look back at people used to do that. They used to wake up and go to these jobs and now we go to different jobs and what jobs will we go to in the future? And so it's a way to, to bring the viewer into my mind's eye thinking about those things. And as a way to encourage that thought as well, to think about the evolution of work, uh, if you read my artist statement, you might have noticed that in each one, in every single painting, I put what replaced the job, what came next that made that job go away, or at least was a factor in that job going away. And so in every single painting I put that, it's often very subtle, uh, it's hidden, it might be an event or an invention, but in each one I put that there to pr provoke that discourse, to provoke those thoughts of the evolution of that job and get it moving in time rather than just being a snapshot of one moment in time. Now I often get the question, you know, why the long limbs? What's your deal? <laughs> and I think when people see my art, they expect me to be either very tall or very short, and pretty average. Uh, but since I was a little kid, I always loved playing with the proportions of figures. I would draw incessantly, and I I remember I would often, uh, you know, do like, big heads or a big arm or. Um, I think I, it might have been seeing caricature artists growing up, I'm not sure, something caught my eye. And so I'd always explored that. And when I went to college and started learning about other artists, I saw the Surrealists, many of whom use these really fantastic, elongated figures to tell their stories or to express their ideas. And so that really stuck with me and that stirred something in me that, that I continue to explore with my art. And so that's kind of the long answer. The short answer is I just think it looks cool. <laughs> um, and as far as my process, I'm going to tell a little bit about that because I don't think that's clear uh, to everyone and, and I kind of I like it that way. It's, it's a mystery. But for those of you that are here, I'm going to give you a little, little explanation. Um, I start with a wood panel. These are all in the wood, either birch or basswood, uh, and I stain it. And then I start painting on it. I paint with acrylics. And so I, you know, this is after planning it out, of course, but I, I paint the, the background and, and the machines and the scene, and then I start making the person. And then I like to make make things. I'm a, a physical artist as well, and so. To make the person, I uh, start with watercolor paper. I make the figure out of watercolor paper, get to get my shape. Then I cover it with a bunch of little hand-torn bits of brown craft paper. And um, then I paint on that and you know, give it that kind of the different hues you see. And then I affix it to the panel. And so it's, it's a way to just ever so gently play with the dimension and also bring the focus to the worker, which is really the, the star of the show in each of my paintings. You know, but most of all, to, this series is all about telling stories, and I just wanted to highlight a few of my favorites, because there are really some gems in here I feel that are not only important, but just entertaining. Um, so, a few of my favorites, right behind Sean there, the snowshoe mailman, if you get a chance to look at him, this gentleman, Snowshoe Thompson, was a crazy Norwegian who signed up to ferry mail across the Sierra Nevadas, 90 miles in all weather, and he did it for 20 years. He was known as a good Samaritan who would take mail even though people couldn't afford postage all the time. He helped people in need. He rescued a couple of stranded folks, um, and that was recorded. And he was just a tough SOB as well. He traveled with just jerky and matches. I mean, just a wild man, as well as the fastest human on the planet at the time, uh, going 60 miles an hour on a ski. Uh, the Bertha Young system, this second one from the corner, it's 
a white background. This is how they used to record IDs of criminals. Instead of fingerprinting, which is what replaced this, they would take all these physical measurements of criminals that came through the system. And that way, if the criminal came back through and tried to give them a false ID, they could prove that it was actually this person uh, in the court of law. And so it's an interesting development, um, which was, yeah, replaced by the, the fingerprinting system. Um, the computer, which is right next to the Bertillon system, that woman is standing there, which often gets mistaken for a, a headmaster of a school, which I like that feeling to it as well. But uh, computers were originally people. A computer was a person who performed computations. And so um, this famous astronomer named Charles Pickering hired a group of women as his computers to help him map the sky. And he did it not to promote, um, town criers would often come out the day before brewing because they were using the water the next day and so they would tell the townspeople to keep their filth out of the river for a day. <laughs> uh, just a couple more I want to point out. The fire lookout in the corner, the big stone tower. Um, not only is it just a, a beautiful, a very proud painting of mine, um, but it's actually based on a fire lookout tower in my home state of South Dakota that you can still hike to today. It's called Harney Peak, and um, it was once manned, and you can now hike up and look up over the Black Hills to uh, yeah, spot your own fires. And finally, the cross-cut Sawyers, which you know, many of you have felt is the, the feature piece, the biggest painting I'd done at that time. Um, the replacement in that one are the chainsaws, which many of you probably noticed. But there's a tiny little chainsaw you get a chance to find on the left-hand side of the painting. It was actually the very first chainsaw that a German surgeon invented to help him saw through bone in his surgeries. So that's kind of cool. Um, you know, telling these stories, I want to tell you a little bit about my story, just a, a quick bio. I know um, Kay alluded to some part of it. I grew up in rural South Dakota, uh, uh, a childhood full of fishing poles and, and tree forts, and just had a very uh, adventurous childhood, and I, I still look back and fondness with that. I've always lived life to the fullest. If you ask my parents, that's always been my motto. Uh, do as much as I can, and, and do it with an open mind and, and a smile on my face, and I continue to do that. Um, I've always, always been drawing. I copied coloring books when I was young. young. I remember always being curious, always learning. Uh, I once tortured my, my stepmother by reading the entire uh, letter C encyclopedia on a car ride to her because I just learned how to read. So I thought I'd hack my way through that for her. I grew up in a tiny town. I, I graduated with nine other people. Nine. <laughs> Yeah, like no zeros, nine. Um, there was no art program in my high school, none. We had music and band, that was it. And I grew up mostly self-taught, of course. Um, but I don't, I don't, you know, look back on that with any disdain. I, I realize that that small of a town it teaches you the value of community and teaches you why you need to connect to people and the value of that. And I, I really. Um, I think that was important for me. Of course, when I went to college, I started exploring new ideas. I met other artists. I started getting, uh, getting taught how to do art, and that was great. And one of my first uh, paintings I did was actually, a, the assignment was a, it was a self, um, a self-study or a, um, you know, an artwork that depicted us in some way, depicted yourself. And so I was really scrambling up against the wall uh, with a deadline, and I had this like, tall panel that I didn't know what to do with. And so I, I had this cowboy in my hand that I always wanted to be a cowboy or something about that. And so I just did this long-lived cowboy, just threw it on there and just turned it in the next day. And his name was Slim Pickens, that's the name of the, the painting, and I still, uh, I see that as the birth of this style, really, for me. And so, sometimes those, those moments just come in the thick of the night, when you're just up against the wall, and that's where it started for me. Um, you know, as Kay said, going through college, I, I met this beautiful young lady who caught my eye and uh, would not return my gaze and my phone calls, and so... <laughs> 
that really caught my attention for many reasons, but she, uh, Ashley and I met, and she, she made me give chase. She got a job in Germany after we graduated and moved there, and so I saved up my money, and five months later I chased her there, and I, I moved to Munich, and we, we traveled Europe, and we, you know, fell in love, of course, and um, that is also where I really developed a, a rich, a deep love of history uh, as well, and I think that comes through in these, um, my time in Europe, because the, the history is so much deeper there, and it's where I also had a chance to experiment with my style and my technique, um, while also teaching English and giving bike tours of Munich, so that was a, a good time. We moved back to the United States, we wanted to start a family of our own, and we start our own family, and so while we were back, I, I got a teaching degree, but continued to practice painting, and continued to do it on those late nights and in my free time, and that's when I started this series, The Jobs of Yesteryear, and that was about five years ago. Um, of course, we had a child, Ivan, and quickly realized that we were not the type of family that would um, resort to spending the evenings with him after a full day at work and, and be happy with that and spending days on the weekend with him. The, the rat race just got to us. And so last May, uh, we actually quit our jobs. We decided to go all in with the art and we quit our jobs and we put all our stuff in storage and we went on the road. And we traveled 17,000 miles last year. and. Uh, we're still, we're still traveling. We have a home now, but um, it's a fun life and I think one that suits us really well. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, that's my story and I guess, you know, the next place I just, what's next for me? I'm going to keep making art that stirs my soul. I'm going to keep looking at art and noticing what grabs me and continue to listen and, and experiment. Um, and just take in all the bounties and the wonderful blessings that life has given me. So I thank you for listening, giving me your time. Um, are there any questions I didn't answer? I <laughs> if you happen to have any, just come find me. I'm happy to talk about what you do or what I do or anything in between. Thank you so much for coming. It's really, it means a lot to me.